Hi everybody, back with you again. Uh, we miss you so terribly bad. Can't wait for this thing to be over right in the middle of this coronavirus scare and, and uh, hope you're not scared. Hope you're trusting the Lord and all that. The Lord didn't give us the spirit of fear. Just didn't give us that spirit. So trust in the Lord and don't be afraid. God knows the number of your days beginning to end. He's got it all planned. He knew, he knew six months ago. He knew six months ago what was ahead. And he'll give you the strength and the ability to get through. Don't be afraid. Just trust him. Just trust him. If you're fearful, this might be a testing time for you to really, really lean upon the Lord. Go someplace with the Lord you've never been before. Spend personal time with God. And God will strengthen you. I guarantee it. It's good to be with you today. Out there preaching this Revelation series. This is the last of, of the Revelation series. We're glad you're with us today. Let's pray for a minute. Lord, bless our time here together today. We love you. Pray for everybody out there listening, Lord. God, each one, we love them. God, if we could just express, if we could just see them. It's, it's sad in my heart that we can't see them right now. But Lord, may your message penetrate their hearts today. May you reveal to us things that have been confusing and difficult to understand. Lord, bless our time together, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, I have, have had this Revelation teaching, six parts of Revelation. You can't end Revelation after six parts, you know, that's the Antichrist number. So, I had to throw a bonus seventh one in, seventh teaching, seventh God number, and that's a completion number. So, Here's the seventh of the series of Revelation. Now, we've taught Revelation beginning to end already. Today, we're going to cover the Antichrist and the Mark of the Beast. Why are we doing that? Because I get a lot of questions about that. And I just want to clear up some stuff. And I've studied and studied. I think I've put 14 hours of study into just the things I'm going to teach you today. So let's just do a quick review, okay? The most important thing I can tell you about Revelation in general is Revelation in time order. You have to take Revelation in time order. I've tried to say that over and over and over and over. People mess up the whole teaching when they take Revelation out of order. It has to be in time order. So, one through three, an introduction and the church age. Lesson two, chapters four and five, the rapture. I finally found spelled scenes, right? Scenes from heaven. Uh, lesson three was the seven seals and seven trumpets in the tribulation period. Lesson four, Revelations 10 through 14, mid-tribulation events. Lesson five, Revelation 15 through 19, the seven bowls, the fall of the Antichrist system we call Babylon. Christ returns to the earth. Uh, wow, powerfully. And then lesson six was him setting up a millennial kingdom and eternity. Today's teaching, like I said, and the Antichrist and the Mark of the Beast. The Antichrist will cover first. Ah. The names for the Antichrist. Daniel is a big place where you see the teaching on the Antichrist. Of course, Revelation is a big place where you see teaching on the Antichrist. We're going to do a teaching today out of Daniel and Revelation. So you'll be seeing a lot of these. Daniel uh, talks about the little horn, the insolent king, the prince who is to come. The one who makes, des uh, makes des desolate. Let me say, go back to this one. A prince who is to come. I've always taught about this Antichrist. And Daniel talks about the, a prince shall arise. I've always believed the Antichrist is a prince that will rise up. So it's, you'll see it as we go along here. Uh, the despicable person, a strong-willed king, the worthless shepherd, a man of lawlessness, the son of destruction, the lawless one, and the beast. Look how many verses where the Antichrist is called the beast. The Antichrist. I hope you can see this slide. His personal characteristics. He's a genius. Daniel says in 8.23, he's super intellectual, super smart. He's a great speaker. Daniel there, 11.36. A politic or a, or a, a, a great politician. Able to work people and, and, and all those things. A Revelation 17, a commercial genius. You could see these verses. A military genius, a religious genius. So the Antichrist isn't a dummy. He's not a dummy at all. He's a man that understands the systems of the world. At some point, he's even empowered by Satan himself. And he's got it going on. And he's slippery. He's slick. He's, he's 
trickery, man. Just really, really smooth. I think he'll be a good looking, just a, kind of a, well, look like Pastor Mark, you know, just be, that's a joke. He'll be a good looking guy, hey, that everybody looks to, and they'll think he's beautiful, and they'll think he's wise, and they'll just, like a movie star, you know what I mean? They'll just go after him, because, oh my goodness, that, that's the guy that's going to save us, you know? His identity, we see in Revelation 13, he comes from the sea. That often refers to he's a Gentile, okay? Um, and he experiences a resurrection. We'll look at that pretty close here coming up. Uh, his ascension to power by the power of Satan in these verses. He's permitted to do whatever he wants by these verses. He, he for, by the formation of ten nations. We're going to look pretty hard at that today. The leader of ten nations. The, by cooperation of false religion, the false prophet comes along and props him up. Uh, by a program of false peace. That should be a C in the Middle East. So he, he brings peace, brings peace at first. And by a master plan of deceit and deception, Matthew, 2 Thessalonians, Revelation 13. We'll look at all this as we go along. Ah, we'll start today in Revelation, okay? The best way I know to do this instead of just jumping around, jumping around, jumping around. So we may teach some stuff in Revelation, then we're going to go to Daniel. And we may teach a thing, something again, but we'll fill it in. We'll make it fuller and fuller as we go along, okay? Here are the chapters. If you want to look up some of this stuff, here are the trip chapters. Here are the verses where we see lots of stuff on the Antichrist. I can't cover it all today. We're going to cover most of it, okay? Revelation chapter 6, verse 2, verse 4, verse 5 and 6 and verse 8. We see the Antichrist come to power. He first comes on a white horse. Then he comes on a red horse. Then he comes on a black horse. Then he comes on a pale horse. And all of those things happen very quickly. Early tribulation event. Early things that happen. How the Antichrist begins to take worldwide power. Revelation 13. This is 1 through 3. Here it is, man. This is the, the, the foundation of the whole teaching about the Antichrist. Okay, And so much of what we're going to talk about is based on these verses right here. <sighs> then I stood on the sand of the sea. And I saw a beast rising up out of the sea. I told you that meant a Gentile. Okay? Having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns. Now that's important. That's important. Okay? We're going to talk about these seven heads. And I believe there's a dual meaning for these seven heads. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. These ten horns talk about ten world leaders... And, and on their on the horns, ten crowns. That means they're kings, like kings. So we're, we're talking about a ten nation or a ten division of the earth. Kingdoms with, with kings over top of them, okay? And on his heads, a blasphemous name. Now, blasphemy means talking against God, right? We understand that. Now, the beast which I saw was a leopard, was like a leopard. His feet was like a bear. His mouth like a lion, the dragon gave him power. Now, the dragon is Satan. Gave him power. And I would love to take the time. I think I have understanding of all this imagery. The leopard and the bear and, and, all, and the lion. The mouth of the lion. And I, all this imagery, I, I'd love to talk to you about that. I happen to think it's a modern day symbol of modern day countries. But we can't get into that right now. The dragon gave him power, his throne, and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it had been mortally wounded. And his deadly wound was healed and all the world marveled and followed the beast. See that? Now, I've been taught my whole life that the Antichrist was going to have some kind of deadly wound. And that he was going to have like a resurrection event happen. Now, there are scriptures, and I'll show them to you in just a minute, where that literally may happen. But as we read this verse, there's something else here that happens. Uh, we see it as, and I saw one of his heads. So are we talking about the Antichrist or one of the kingdoms? 
It's just a thought there. So it might have a dual meaning. It might have that understanding where something actually happens to him, or it may happen to one of the kingdoms or one of the kings. Okay? But in any of it, they arise back after they think they're dead. They arise back to life. And, and what happens from that is what's really important is the Antichrist gets credit and is praised for this resurrection event that happens. We look at it again. Seventh head is wounded to death. And we just see that verse again. The manifestation of the seventh head gets a deadly wound by a sword, which could mean my war is one of the kingdoms almost destroyed by war. Some people think that. It seems to die at first, but then it gets healed. And the world is totally amazed. This section of verses, Revelation 13, the second half of 14, says, and I put these ver this word in here, to make image of the beast. So it's talking about the false prophet making an image of the beast who was wounded by the sword and yet lived. Now, it's interesting. Wounded by the sword could mean war. Wounded by the sword could mean an actual, literally, attack of, of an Antichrist person. In Zechariah, we see, Zechariah 11, 17, Woe to the worthless shepherd, now that's the Antichrist, who deserts the sheep. May the sword strike his arm and right eye. Look at that. There's some verses there where it looks like it's very specific about a person getting a sword. Doesn't it say sword? A sword strikes his arm and right eye. So it looks like, literally, in Zechariah, a sword comes and hits his arm and right eye. I'd want to teach you that there's a dual purpose in this meaning of, of a, a deadly wound is healed. Of his heads, either of one of the kingdoms or one of the nations, or the Antichrist himself gets attacked. And in some way, so I think there's a dual thing there. You can see it in the scripture as you look at it. There's more than one. And God often does these amazing things that are bigger than we think. And uh, the word of God is, is very, very wonderful and very, very exact. So this is just, uh, look, it may his arm be completely, what's that say? Shriveled and his right eye totally blinded. So that Zechariah verse kind of points us towards the Antichrist himself being wounded. But these other verses kind of point towards one of his kings or kingdoms is taken out by war. So there's a dual meaning there, I believe. <sighs> Revelation 17.9 says, Here is the mind which has wisdom. So it seems like the Lord is trying to help us in, in the complicated understanding of this thing. So here's what wisdom. I'll give you understanding of some stuff. The seven heads are the seven mountains on which the woman sits. So we read in here along, we see seven heads with ten horns, all that kind of thing going on. The, the, the Bible itself says the seven heads are, are talking about seven mountains. Now, I believe again, when we see the seven, he, the seven heads phrase, it's a dual meaning again. A lot of people believe, some people believe there's seven hills around Rome. And it says here, the seven heads are seven mountains, which the woman sits. The woman's talking about like a prostitute. It's talking about the, the ungodly system of the Antichrist. So it may refer to Rome being the, the center of the Antichrist kingdom. Where the capital of his kingdom is. You see that? And it's saying right here, it's saying clearly in Scripture, seven heads are seven mountains. And people say that Rome is surrounded by these seven big hills. And it points to this idea that maybe this is the, the center of the Antichrist kingdom. Remember, we're talking about these seven heads. We go along here, there's that verse again, seven heads are seven mountains. There are also seven kings. Do you see that? I left it here in, in its context. Here's the mind of wisdom. Seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. That's what we just talked about. There are also seven kings. So it looks like to me these seven heads represent seven mountains. We talked about what that might be. But it also represents seven kings. 
Okay, seven kings. And then in the, you know, in the Revelation 13 verse, it goes on to say, and, and ten horns, and each horn has a crown. Okay, we're going to break that all down. But here we're looking at these seven heads that could represent these seven mountains, which represent Rome. And also we represent these seven kings. Now, are we talking about the same kings that are the ten kingdoms? No, the number's different. Seven so what is the seven kings, okay? I'll try to break that down for you here. Who are the seven kings? We're going to read a verse in a second where the Antichrist is the eighth of seven. You understand that? So try to break this down. I hope you can see it. The Antichrist is the, is the ruler of the whole earth. So we go back to this understanding how many dynasties have there been, how many kingdoms have there been that have, been ruled, have ruled the whole earth. And we kind of get this seven kings or seven kingdoms from these seven dynasties. Egypt ruled the whole earth at one time. Assyria ruled the Babylon, Mede, Persia, Greece, Rome. Now look, it's going to get really clear as I read you some more verses. The seventh here, hey, represents probably these ten kings. Because what happens as soon as the rapture happens... Hey, the Antichrist is coming to power, but the earth is probably divided into 10 different regions that has 10 different kings. But at that point, 10 kings will rule the whole earth. And a lot of people, including myself, believe that the seventh worldwide kingdom will be joined together as one government with, with, with 10 kings. You understand that? And that's the seventh worldwide government. Okay, I believe it's after the rapture. It's right in the tribulation period. And you'll see a verse in a minute. It says it's just for a moment. Okay, and then the eighth king is the Antichrist. Catching me? I'll show you verses. It's really clear. The ten horns which you saw are ten kings. Who have received no kingdom yet, but they have received authority for one hour as kings with the beast. So 10 kings, 10 regions of the earth. Hey, they don't have, what's it say? They have no, no kingdom, but well, they're ruling over a region. I believe they're really financial. Uh, what do you say? Uh, we've had it kind of going on. As the economy all breaks down, there's going to be these, well, we have the G8 now, or the 10, the eight biggest economies of the world meeting. And I see these uh, G10 type of thing happening where the 10 biggest economies are saying, hey, all the currency is falling, everything's corrupt, everything. That gets us towards the mark of the beast. But what do we do now that, that everything is collapsing? And they set up 10 regions. And it says here they have received no kingdom. They're just trying to solve these 10 kings. They're trying to solve the issues of the world. And they have representation from every area of the world. But they certainly over the whole world. That's why I think they represent the seventh kingdom. The seventh head. Okay. These are the ones. The one mind. These are of one mind. And they will give their power and authority to the beast. These will make war with the lamb. That's the Lord. They're. They're fighting against God, fighting against God's purpose, fighting against everything that's godly. And the Lamb will overcome them. In the end, the, the Lord, the Lamb of God, overcomes them. For He is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those who are with Him are called chosen and faithful. Yeah! yeah. Just throw a picture in there. As we look in Daniel, we'll see Daniel. But I think Daniel's going to confirm everything that we've kind of learned in Revelation. Okay? We'll add to it. We'll fill it up a little bit more. So we look at Daniel's verses related to the Antichrist. Now, in Daniel 2, if you're any kind of Bible study at all, Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. Daniel interprets the dream. These are the previous kingdoms. I hope that isn't too blurry. Babylon, Mede, Persia, Greek Empire, Roman Empire. And then there's this last empire, iron and clay, which represents the, the time of the end. Two feet, listen, two feet represent 
we think an east and west side to the kingdom of the Antichrist. Okay, two feet represent two parts of it. Ten toes, which represent ten kingdoms, right? We get that? In Nebuchadnezzar's dream of Daniel 2. Uh, it's explained here. If you read Daniel 2, there's a dream and then there's an interpretation. But it gets explained. Daniel explains. Whereas you saw, 40, Daniel 2, 41, Whereas you saw the feet and toes partly of potter's clay, partly of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. Two feet. Right? Some people say it's a European part. Okay? Of this fire. And a Middle Eastern part, possibly. That's how the old Roman Empire was set up, too. Kingdom shall be divided, yet the strength of iron will be in it, just as you saw the mixed iron mixed with clay. And as the toes of the feet are partially iron and partially clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly frail. <sighs> strong, because they're controlling the, all the people of the earth, but frail because everything's falling apart. Everything's a total disaster. Everybody, kind of like what we feel like right now in America, you know, with this virus going around. What's going to happen next? Everybody's on edge. Everybody, you know, everybody's wondering about what's going to happen. If there's a bunch of fear. There's a bunch of stuff going on. And they will mingle with the seed, with the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another, just as iron does not mix with clay. And I could spend a lot of time talking about that. We just don't have the time. Ah. <sighs> This is in Daniel. We're talking about in Daniel. This is the dream and the interpretation of the dream in Daniel 2. What happens? As you go out there and study Daniel, you begin to see people teaching this idea that Daniel 2 and Daniel 7 and Daniel 8 and Daniel 11 and 12 are all the same thing. I'm telling you, no way. There's no way. Why would Daniel spend half of his book about things that are completely the same? What I want to tell you is that in each one of these chapters, God is unveiling more of the understanding of the end of time. So what you'll see when you go out there is this out there, look on the Internet, that all these things are the same. Like in Daniel 7, there's four creatures, and then they have to add other stuff here. To make it line up with Daniel, it's not. In Daniel 8, it's primarily about a ram and a goat. And then they have to add other stuff to make it add up to that. In Daniel 11 and 12, it talks about four kings and a king in the north and a king in the south. But they have to kind of break this off. Look, they can't even, to make it add, it just don't work. But the primary teaching you see out there on the internet and out there with people is that the Daniel 2, Daniel 7, Daniel 8, Daniel 11, 12 are this basically the same understanding, the same thing. And I'm telling you, no. Each one of them are independent and have additional information about end time events. Daniel 7. Just for time, there's four beasts there. The final beast is the Antichrist. Okay? If I go back one... Look at this. The final beast here to make these line up. The final beast right here <laughs> lines up with Rome. It, it's just when we know this final beast is the Antichrist. That makes sense. It just this doesn't this teaching where all these line up don't make sense. OK, so Daniel seven, we're talking about the fourth beast, which is the Antichrist. OK. And after this, I saw the night vision. Then behold, a fourth beast, dead, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It's the Antichrist. Trust me. It has huge iron teeth. It was devouring and breaking in pieces and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it. And it had ten horns. This isn't Rome. This isn't ancient Rome. This is the Antichrist, the fourth beast in, in, in Daniel 7. It's the Antichrist. It doesn't line up. I'm telling you, this, some of that teaching just doesn't line up. I'm troubled by, as I go out there and study this, the different opinions about Revelation and Daniel, that, that I, it, it's pretty easy for me to tell you most of the, thinking out there isn't right 
So this is the Antichrist. And I considered the horns. And there was another horn, a little one, coming up among them, before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots. And there in, the, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth that speaks pompous words. So Daniel, here's what Daniel's doing. Daniel's giving us more information to what we learned in Revelation. There were ten kingdoms with ten kings, right? And out of those ten kingdoms, those ten horns, a man comes and he pops out three of those horns to be the ruler of all. Catching all that? That's the fourth beast. In Daniel 7, so we see this idea of ten kingdoms again. And, and we get a little more information, because Daniel gives us more information, that there are ten kings. For a moment, there are ten kings that rule the earth. You get that whole thing? But then one rises up out of three of them and takes it all over. And he, as eyes of me, and a mouth speaking pomp, he's a proud, boastful, solve all our problems. Accomplish everything. Confident. Good looking. The fourth beast of Daniel 7. See, we had ten horns and one pops up. It starts out little, but it pops up and takes out three. There, there are ideas out there. People have some ideas of how, what that's going to be and, and who and all that thing, but we're not going to get that today. Talk to me private. I'll let you know what I think. And the fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be different from all the other kingdoms. And shall devour the whole earth. We, we know the Antichrist kingdom takes power over the whole earth. Right? And tramples it and breaks it into pieces. The ten horns are ten kings. We saw that. Right? Who arise from the kingdom, from this kingdom. And another shall arise after them. And he shall be different from the first ones and shall subdue three kings there it is and it shall speak pompous words of the most high we repeat ourselves and shall persecute the saints of the most high now people listen to me once we get past revelation 4 1 the rapture of the church we're in the tribulation period we don't talk about the church anymore in Revelation. We talk about saints because people are coming to the Lord after the rapture. We're in a period of time here where the rapture has already occurred. The Antichrist is doing his thing on planet Earth. And we see the word saints. And shall persecute the saints of the Most High. These are people who have come to the Lord after the rapture of the church. You don't see the church mentioned any place in these tribulation verses, you see Christians mentioned here as saints. And actually, in other places, they're called martyred saints because the Antichrist kills them. So, in the tribulation, one man comes up. Who's he going after? If he's the son of the devil or, or the, the devil's master, you know, or the, the master is the devil of this man, then, then he's going to be after those who love the Lord, right? I mean, that's, that's right. And the scripture clearly says he, uh, he's, he'll be against the Most High and shall persecute the saints of the Most High. So if I'm of the devil, I'm going after my adversary, God's people first. I'm going after, I'm getting a man. Tearing them up. And shall intend and shall intend to change times and laws. So with power, he's going to try to change it all. He's going to start. Then the saints will be given into his hand. Remember? It's this idea that Christians in the tribulation are killed for their faith. For a time times and half a time three and a half years is what that means now i put this in here because we keep seeing 10 kings 10 kings or 10 kingdoms this is a pretty old map some people think if the world if the economies of the world were to fall apart this is what the divisional map of the earth would look like now i can go in here now i can tell you this map is a little bit old 
like right here, this yellow one, is Turkey. Turkey's become more Muslim in nature and, and, and less European. This is your, so, you know, they were very European for a while, so they colored this yellow with the European. It's probably more with the, uh, the Muslim group now. It'd probably be more purple now. So there's some stuff on this map that hasn't been updated. Let me put it that way. But it's this idea that a lot of these Spanish-speaking nations, I know Brazil speaks Portuguese, but it's close, all these nations speak kind of the same language, so they'd be grouped together. These are English speakers. These are European, you know, these are all Islamic states. China, India, and Indonesia, Russia, Australia, and, and South Africa all speak the British English, you know, so... Just somebody taking a shot at how the economic zones of these ten kings might be broken up. And, you know, which of the three kingdoms does the Antichrist push out of the way to rule over it all? We don't know. But we know that's going to happen. Now, interesting verses, Daniel 9. Then he, who are we talking about? The Antichrist. He shall confirm a covenant for many for one week. Now, I've said this for years and years and years. We're talking about a peace treaty in the Middle East. It's in particular in Israel with their Palestinian enemies. A covenant will be made. There's going to be a, a peace treaty made. And from that peace treaty, Israel is going to build a temple. Okay, because we see a temple halfway through the tribulation period. So then he, the Antichrist, as he comes, he will confirm. I always believe that in the last days, in the very last days before the rapture of the church, we will see a peace treaty that allows Israel to have peace. Hey, and to build a temple. And when the Antichrist comes, he will just agree with it. He will agree with it. But in the middle of the week, week meaning the seven-year tribulation period, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. Well, what's that mean? They're sacrificing and bringing their offerings to a temple. So he's going to end temple worship because he's going to go in and declare himself to be king, to worship him. So he brings it to an end. And on the wing of abomination shall be one who makes desolate even until the, cons till the consummation, which is determined, is poured out, out on the desolate. What it's saying is, halfway through the tribulation period, the Antichrist is going to call himself God and co command that everybody begins to worship him. And that's called the abomination of desolation, and that's what Daniel's referring to here. It's right in the middle of the tribulation a middle event, and then the great tribulation, the last three and a half years. Seven-year covenant that provides for there to be a temple on the Temple Mount. More verses about the Antichrist. Then the king shall do according to his own will. You know, he's, he's a one-world leader. He's the emperor of the earth, so he'll do whatever he wants. And he will exalt and magnify himself above every god. Shall speak blasphemies against the god of gods. And shall prosper till the wrath has been accomplished. Now we always talk about the wrath of God being the tribulation period. Remember I, in the very beginning I talked about the church age. We were not appointed to wrath. A whole bunch of places. But four times in particular the church was not appointed to wrath. When the church leaves in a rapture, there's a period of God's wrath being poured out. So he'll reign and speak blasphemies against God until the wrath has been accomplished. The seven year of pouring out of God's judgment upon the earth. For it has been determined and shall be done. You know what that means, don't you? God said, it will be. That's what it is. And he shall regard neither the God of his fathers. That means... I, I don't want to get too far off into what I think, but that means whoever his fathers worshipped, he's not going to worship them. 
Hey, because he's saying he's God. And nor the desire of women. Boy, there's all kinds of ideas about that. Some people say that he might be gay. There's other people that have other takes on that thing. So you can get out there and look at that. There's many different. I don't know that we're ever going to know for sure until we actually know who the man is. And it'll make sense just like the scripture does always. Nor regard any God for he shall exalt himself above them all. Talking about the Antichrist. That's just kind of a weird real picture. Just looks in time-ish to me. Looks like a man sitting before some crazy... Ah, and it's a real life picture. Now, just real quickly to close this thing out. Other major Antichrist passages. Now, I'm going to help you. These are a lot easier to understand. They were written to the church. They were written for us to understand. This should really help us. L listen, if you're here when the Antichrist is doing his thing, you're going to really need this tape because you missed the rapture. I'm hoping <laughs> none of you need any of this teaching. I hope none of you do. But the verses we're about to read are written to the church so that we might have understanding before that season comes. Okay? In, in Thessalonica, there's some bad teaching about the Lord's return. And because of that bad teaching, Paul writes him a letter to try to help, and it helps us now. In verse 1, I just stuck this in here, concerning the coming of the Lord Jesus. Okay? Verse 3, let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless a falling away comes first. <laughs> Meaning... People are going to start pursuing selfish things. And God isn't going to be the center of the world anymore. Hmm. They'll fall away from the church. We've seen it in Europe terribly. We're seeing it right now in America. I mean, really, we're seeing, we're seeing anti-God things begin to occur all the time. People don't push back on them anymore because God is not... God of the heaven is not their God. So people do whatever people want to do. If they don't have a God that, that, that determines what's good and what's right and what's fair and, and what's important to him and, and how they should live, then they'll just do whatever they want to do. Amen. The Antichrist had said a minute ago about the Antichrist, and he'll do whatever he wants to do. The spirit of Antichrist says, we'll do whatever we want to do. Everything's okay. So we're in this period of the falling away. I guarantee it. So, let nobody deceive you, for, any, for that day will not come unless there's a falling away and the man of sin is revealed. So, that day isn't going to come until there's a big falling away. We're in the middle of that. Hey, and the Antichrist is revealed. To who? Well, the world may see him come up and everybody see, may see this guy as somebody in fact he might be on the stage right now I will tell you I believe he's on the stage right now and for us Christians at some point as we watch I think we'll begin to know who that is so a falling away will occur and an antichrist will be revealed for those that are watching the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worship, so that he sits in the temple of God, temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And that's that abomination of desolation. We're halfway through the tribulation. He sits in the temple and says, Hey, no more sacrifice, no more offer. I'm God. It all fits together. The scripture even though it's sometimes complicated to put the pieces together because they're found in different places and they're, well, many, many hundreds and hundreds, seven, eight, nine hundred years between, between these verses, we can still fit it all together. It's still got to make sense. The scripture doesn't contradict itself at all. And we can plug these pieces together if we study hard. Great falling away. Reading on there in 2 Thessalonians 2, do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? So Paul was with them and told them, listen, don't fall for false teaching. And I told you when I was there, now I'm telling you in this letter I'm writing to you. 
And now you know what is restraining that he may be revealed in his own time. Now, and now you know what is restraining that he may be revealed in his own time. You know, because it says he here, what is restraining? He may be revealed. Okay, and you know what is restraining. It's this idea that at the time of the rapture, what has been holding back Satan and lawlessness is left. Some people teach it's the church. More than likely, it's the Holy Spirit. Leaves. And so when the, the restrainer is gone, there's an opening for something evil to come in. So when what is restraining is taken away, here he comes. Here he comes. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. We already see an Antichrist ideology. It's already at work. Only he who now restrains will... Okay, there it is. There's the he. I'm looking. Only he... I knew it was there someplace. And he who now restrains, he who now restrains will do so until he... Some people think that he is talking about the Holy Spirit is taken out of the way. If it was the church, it'd be until the church is taken out of the way. But it's saying he here, probably the Holy Spirit. And then the lawless one will be revealed. So as soon as the Holy Spirit, the rapture of the church, the church goes out, the Holy Spirit pulls back. Well, here he is. Nothing's stopping him. Whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth. You know, at the, in the end, the Lord comes back in a white horse and is, whoosh, consumes him. And the brightness of his coming. And the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders. The Antichrist will have power, signs, and wonders. And then the lawless ones will be revealed. When the rapture happens, the lawlessness one will come. I'm trying to hurry along here. With an unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. So he's just going to deceive the ones that were lost. And for this reason, God will send a strong delusion that they should believe the lie. Hmm. So people are going to believe the Antichrist is, is the answer. He's the Messiah. He's the, they're going to believe in him. That they may be condemned who did not believe in the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Warning, there's a strong delusion coming for those who would not receive uh, the love of the truth. Talk real quick about the mark of the beast. I'm trying to hurry. Mark of the beast, Revelation 13. He, the false prophet, was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast. So the false prophet was granted, to, they make an image of the beast. Now get this. And the false prophet, with this power and signs and all that stuff, gives power to the image of the beast. And the image of the beast uh, would speak and, and cause as many as would not worship the image to be killed. This freaky, man. So you're living here in the tribulation and there's an image of the beast and all of a sudden this, this image of the beast speaks. And the false prophet says, now worship that. And if you don't worship it, you're going to be killed. Because if this, we, we've gone past the point now, this is a great world leader. We're now at the point where this is God. This is God. So you have to worship that. Can't you see the miracles? Can't you see that he rose from the dead? Can't you see? Can't you see? This is, he declared himself God. He is God. Now worship him. And if you don't worship him, and he will cause small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive the mark on their right hand or on their foreheads. A mark on their right hand or foreheads. Now you believe and I believe that there's going to be some kind of electronic device like a chip. I also believe there's going to be a mark. There's going to be a physical mark on a person so that from a distance you can see that person has a mark. It's not going to be 
Like our dog, we put a chip in there. We don't know there's a chip in there until we run a scanner. But I'm telling you, there's going to be a physical because everybody's going to know who does and who doesn't because they're going to hunt down the ones who don't. Kill them. And that no one may buy or sell except the one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. I know this sounds crazy, but you just saw it in the last month how when panic came on the earth, people were going running for toilet paper. And if we had this little chip in us, the, the old, the old uh, Antichrist or the leader of the world could, could regulate what we can buy and what we could sell. He'll know. And when all of our bank accounts have fallen apart and everything's a total mess and we're living off the government because it's all about a form of government that is controlled by the Antichrist, then he'll, he'll put money in our bank account. It'll be, we'll, we'll count on him for everything and we can buy and sell based on how many kids we have in our family and how many this and that. And his system's going to seem beautiful. It's going to seem wonderful. It's going to seem fair. It's going to seem, but it's all a big lie. And the truth of the matter is, once you receive this mark, I think I have the verse here, once you receive this mark, it's over. Once you receive a mark, it's over. You've committed yourself to the kingdom of Satan in his ways. And many, many will not take the mark and will be killed. And we saw that in previous verses. So this is the big section of verses on the mark of the beast. People ask me questions about all that all the time. And no one may buy or sell except the one who has the mark of the name of his name of the beast or the number of his name. What is that? Well, we know it's 666. I think somebody said IBM had a scan thing and part of that scan name was 66, the number 6, I don't know. But it has something to do with 666. Some people say it has to do with the, well, it says it right here, but, well, here's wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast for it is the number of man that his number is 666. So somehow it has to do with the six month of six day of 66. I, I, I don't know, I'm making... That's four sixes. I, so I don't know, but it'll make sense at the time. It, and some people say, well, there's a number associated to every letter and a name and, and all those things. I don't know. I, I got a feeling we won't know until we know who the person is. And I got a feeling it'll be one of those things like DNA. It'll be one assigned to one person only, and that'll be it. And that'll be the one. But it'll be a, for buying and selling. It'll be so the Antichrist can control the movement of men. And if they don't worship him, they don't move. They don't buy or sell. In fact, they'll eventually lose their life. The image of the beast. Worshiping the image of the beast. Can you imagine something like that all of a sudden speaking? Boy, that'd be freaky. Revelation 14, 11, the smoke of their torment ascended forever and ever, and they have no rest day and night. Who worship the beast or his image, and whoever received the mark of his name. So this says if you receive the mark, torment forever and ever, and have no rest day or night. There's the verse on that. Here's our concluding verse. I love it when we get here at the end of verse nine, chapter 19. Revelation. And I heard as it were the voice of a great multitude, as the sounds of many waters and the sounds of mighty thunderings, saying, Hallelujah, Hallelujah. You know, here we're at the end, man. We got to the end. We're, you, the, the Antichrist kingdom has fallen down, and, and, and a voice, the multitude, the, those that know the Lord are saying, Hallelujah, finally it's over. For the Lord God omnipotent reigns. And let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory. For the marriage supper of the Lamb has come. Where's the marriage supper of the Lamb? Well, it's after the Antichrist kingdom comes down and all the saints from all the ages gather together. Glorious! There it is, the marriage supper of the Lamb. And his wife has made, made herself ready. The wife has made his, his, wife, his wife, the bride, the church, the believers made herself ready and to her it is granted to be arrayed in fine linen (laughs) 
Never had nothing fine in my life, you know what I mean? Got the Walmart collection of, of clothing in my house, you know what I mean? The Lord's going to have me some fine linen up there. Anyhow, clean and bright. For the fine, for the fine linen is the righteousness, righteous acts of the saints. And he said to me, right, blessed are those who, who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true sayings of God. Amen. Isn't that wonderful? Hallelujah. 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 So I've taught now this seven-part series on Revelation. First six parts flies through Revelation. Just the major points flying through Revelation. This final teaching is about the Antichrist and the mark of the beast. And where those primary verses are, you can go there and look for them for yourself. But I wanted to get that out there. Now listen to me. Nobody out there under my voice right now needs any of this teaching that I taught lesson seven. You don't need to know about the Antichrist. You don't need to know about the mark of the beast because you're not going to be here, right? Amen. If you don't know the Lord, pray this simple sinner's prayer. Lord, I need you. I love you. Forgive me of my sin. Forgive me, Lord. Forgive me. Forgive me. Lord, I want to be with you. I want to live with you. All this craziness, all this thing that's out there, even the things I see now, Lord, in my life, all this stuff is a warning sign, God. You're trying to get my heart right. You're trying, Lord, to speak to me about how quickly the world's kingdom and all the things we think are man and God, uh, man and all man's great devices and all their financial things, how quickly it can just fall. God, in this moment of time, we just, we got you. Sickness runs around us, Lord. It's all around us. But God, we stand in you. We pray, God, there comes an end. Lord, for those of us who trust in you, there's an end to all these crazy things. And you just come and get us. For the wrath of God is reserved for the unrighteous. Huh. And heaven was made for those who trust in you. Lord, no matter how bad this world gets, I know my future, Lord, with you is amazing.